All right, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, where we're going to continue in our study through the book of Romans. We have been uh, absent from the book the last two weeks because of Easter and before that Palm Sunday. So just by way of a, a quick review to bring us up to speed where we are heading into Romans chapter 8, chapters 6 and 7, we talked about how Paul describes a battle within every Christian. Now, there is not a battle within the non-believer. Uh, the non-believer has no internal conflict, really, because the non-believer basically does what he or she wants to do within reason. The only restraint is basically the law of the land or the person's God-given conscience. Otherwise, the non-believer basically does what the non-believer wants to do because it's all about the thank you line at Chick-fil-A, my pleasure. That's what it's all about. It's all about my pleasure. It's what I want to do because I live my life for me. I'm on the throne of my life. I'm the captain of my ship, that whole thing. Okay, but it's different for the Christian because the Christian doesn't live for my pleasure. The Christian lives for the Lord's pleasure. We want to please the Lord, and so we want to live our lives to glorify Him. But that's not always easy. The reason it's not easy is because there is an internal conflict for the believer. And the reason is because when a person gets saved, that is to say, when he or she puts faith in Jesus Christ, trusts Jesus, and has a relationship with Jesus, your spirit within gets regenerated, but your body does not. And so your spirit within wants to please the Lord, your body still wants to live for self. And your body has appetites, passions, and desires that the body always wants to gratify. Now, by the way, not every appetite, desire, or passion is wrong or sinful. God has given us certain appetites, passions, and desires. It is only when we operate those passions, appetites, or desires outside of God's parameters. When God says something is right and He says something is wrong, and we, we function in those appetites or passions outside of God's parameters, then it's sin. But otherwise, He's given us these appetites, so don't see them as sin in and of themselves. This isn't Buddhism, friends. Okay, Buddhism teaches that. Buddhism teaches that the ultimate pursuit is nirvana. And when you reach nirvana, then you have no desire. Because desire is wrong, so no desire. Which is really a contradiction in terms when you think about it. Because you can never get to a place of no desire without having a desire to get there. <laughs> think about it. So Christianity is not Buddhism. It's not like desire is wrong, passions are wrong, appetites are wrong. Only when they function outside of God's parameters and His best design. So because a believer is saved within, but still is housed in a body that is not regenerated, there's this war, there's this conflict. And a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how um, it's like the heart of a dog and the body of a cat. And I got some emails on that, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I've said it's not a good sermon without a couple of emails once in a while. But uh, you know, think about the heart of a dog, loyal, loving, obedient, you know, trapped in a body that is evil and wicked, malicious. <laughs> won't listen to anybody. By the way, I did get some, you know, some upset emails, but I also got a booklet, uh, just an excellent resource material from somebody watching online. They mailed it to me, 101 uses for a dead cat. It was an excellent resource. <laughs> I'm going to get more emails today, but anyhow, it's, but the idea, you know, cat and dog, they war. Okay, so it's somewhat like that for every single one of us. There's a war within. You want to please God, but there's this fleshly part of you that does it. You want to live for yourself. Paul describes it in a much more spiritual way than I do about dogs and cats. I'm going to step aside and show you again Romans chapter 7 from the ESV, and then we'll get into chapter 8. He describes it, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, in my spirit, but I see in my members, in my flesh, Another law, waging war, there's the language, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, 
And then he asks this question, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers it himself, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so, he lays out this battle, and and then he's going to take us here into chapter 8, if you have your Bibles open now to chapter 8, and he's going to tell us here, more specifically, when he says, who's going to rescue me from this wretched body of, of death? And he answers it, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ my Lord. He's going to get even more specific in chapter 8. And he's going to tell us it's really the power and help of the Holy Spirit that the Lord is giving us to dwell within us, to help us, because we need his help. So it's interesting, when you look at Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8 together as a package, you look at all three of those chapters. In Romans 6, Paul doesn't mention the Spirit once, because he's describing the battle. And also he describes it further in chapter 7. And in chapter 7, he only mentions the Spirit once. Zero times in chapter 6, one time in chapter 7. But when we get here to chapter 8, Paul mentions the Spirit 21 times. Because his point is, this is going to be our help. We need to understand how the Spirit of God will help us to win the war within. Now, When we look at chapter 8, you're going to see there are three things in particular that the Spirit does to help us. And I'm just going to tell you right now, those three things I'm going to be sharing next week, okay? (laughs) Because there are two other things I want us to see in this eighth chapter, and they are exhortations or words of encouragement that Paul gives us to strengthen us concerning this war within. And they're like bookends here in chapter 8. He's going to tell us one exhortation in the first part of the chapter, and then he's going to tell us another exhortation at the end of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles open there to Romans 8, I'm going to first read the first eight verses. And he writes this, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For Those who live according to the flesh set their minds, hear that word, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, that's the first exhortation. Then jump down to the end of the chapter. Look at verse 37, 37 to 39. He closes out the chapter with these words. Verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded... That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, did you get those two exhortations? I'm going to give them to you for you note takers. Here they are. The first one is no condemnation. The second one is no separation. No separation from the love of God. So we're going to look at these two because these are important. We've got to get these deep down into our soul. And I'm going to talk about these two today. But fair advanced warning, you know, if you're like an engineer type and you like to analyze everything, I am not going to spend as much time on the second point as I am the first one. Because the second one's pretty self-explanatory. So don't be calculating the time and going, man, he's burned the whole 40 minutes. (laughs) On point number one, he has no time for the second one. Just relax. It's all going to work out. (laughs) 
Let's pray first, and I'll ask the Lord to help me work it out. (laughs) Father, we come before you, and we humble ourselves, and we ask, Lord, that you'd speak to us concerning these two exhortations today. I know that there are people who need to hear down deep in their spirit that they are no longer under condemnation. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And I also believe, Lord, that there are people here today down deep in their soul. They need to know how loved they are by you. There is no separation from your love. So may we leave here today with a greater awareness and understanding and a grasp that there is no condemnation and no separation from your love for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we commit the Bible study to you now, Lord. Speak to our hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So go back to the beginning of this eighth chapter. Let's take the first one first. And I want you to notice with me, and I I emphasized it with my voice when I was reading through the first few verses, the word mind, minded, minds. He mentions it four times, that word, between verses 5, 6, and 7. He mentions minds once in verse 5, minded twice in verse 6, the word mind again in verse 7, four times. In addition, the opening passage I read when I stepped aside and read it off the screen is from the end of chapter 7. At the end of chapter 7, Paul references the word mind twice in verse 23 and 25. So you have here in a space of just a few verses, six times, Paul talks about the mind. Please understand this. When we talk about winning the war within, we have to realize that the battle begins in the mind, right here, right here, which is why it is so critical that we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Now, that's not my point. That's God's point straight out of the Bible. There's a verse on it. I'll give it to you in the NIV. It's 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We have to do this. Our mind can run wild with sinful thoughts. We have to take captive every sinful thought lustful, vengeful, spiteful, hateful, prideful. I mean, just take a bad word, add F-U-L to the end, that, and rein it in. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor G, you know, it's just my thoughts. It's not hurting anybody. It's hurting you, and it's hurting our Lord because he knows your thoughts. Psalm 139, verses 1 and 2 Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. So God knows what we're thinking. God knows our thoughts. How displeasing or sinful are our thoughts to the Lord? That's paramount. But in addition, it's hurting ourselves. Here's why. Because when we entertain sinful thoughts, we are more apt to act on them. Do we realize that a lot of our sinful action can be prevented if we would harness our thought life. If we would take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, every sinful, wrong thought, before we act on it, when it does become sin, we have to harness our thought life. We have to rein it in. We have to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's that's so fundamental to winning the war within because most of our behavior is premeditated. We act on what we first think or imagine. And so we can win a lot of the war in terms of our sinful behavior by reining in our sinful thought life. So don't think, well, as long as I don't act on it, it's okay for me to entertain all these thoughts. No, it's not, because that's the devil's playground, and it not only offends God, it's harmful to us. So we must work on this. Rein in our thought life. 
And here's in addition why it's so important to also harness our thought life and take captive every thought. Because it, it's not only bad to entertain sinful thoughts, but the other aspect of our thought life is we have to stop believing the lies. We have to stop believing the lies. So we're not only taking captive the sinful thoughts, we're taking captive the lies that we shouldn't believe. Because we are being lied to all the time. And it's important for us to understand this. Now, as it relates to our thought life, this is verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Because where does condemnation, where is it processed? It's in our minds. When we think about condemnation, it's in our thoughts. And so here's what we need to understand in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. Everybody say now. now. It's not later. It's not sometime down the road. It's not when you die and get to heaven. God says there is therefore now, now for us, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. What does that part mean? It means who has a relationship with Jesus. If you have had your sins forgiven because you've trusted Christ who died on the cross for your sins and my sins, and you surrendered your life to him, you are in Christ. And friends, you are either in or you are out. There is no neutral ground. There is no demilitarized zone when it comes to Jesus. You are either for him or against him. You cannot be neutral. You are either in or you are out. Now, the good news is if you are in, there's no condemnation for you. If you're out, there is condemnation. This is not me, this is Jesus saying it. John 3, 17 and 18. He said, for the Son of Man, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Whoever believes in Him shall not be condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him stands condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only Son. This is what Jesus said straight out of John chapter 3. He came to save sinners, but if we reject him, then we will be condemned. If we ask him to forgive us and have a relationship with him and accept him, then we will not be condemned. And this is the promise here of Romans 8, 1. There's therefore now no condemnation, but listen, to them that are in Christ Jesus. Now, for many of us who have been around the block in terms of our Christian journey for a little while, you are very well aware of this next thing I'm about to say, which is John 8 verse 44, Jesus calls out Satan and calls him a liar and the father of lies. How many of you know Satan is a liar? Okay. If you don't know that, then you've been lied to <laughs> by Satan. Who doesn't want you to think that he's a liar? He wants you to think he's a good guy. They say Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And let me tell you the two ways that he lies to us about condemnation. All right. The first way that he lies are to non-believers. And to non-believers, he loves to quote this verse. Satan knows scripture, by the way. He quoted it to Jesus when he tempted Jesus in Luke chapter 4. And Satan loves to go around trying to convince non-believers, there's no condemnation for you. There's no condemnation for you. You're fine, just as you are. All right? Um, it's not abortion. It's your choice. It's not fornication. You love each other. It's not cohabitation. You're just trying to save some money. It's not drunkenness. You're just having a good time. See, Satan has a big thesaurus, and he loves to rebrand things. And he loves to try to convince you, just like Isaiah 5 talked about. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, light for darkness and darkness for light. Satan is doing that in our culture right now. He's trying to convince people all day long, and it's not new to our day. He's been doing this since his rebellion. He's trying to convince people all day long that what is up is really down, what's down is really up, what's right is really not that bad, and what's wrong is actually pretty good. And he wants people to believe it. And so he quotes, and he goes around making people think, as non-believers, there's no condemnation for you. And everybody's applauding, and they feel good about themselves. And Satan's saying, yeah, you just be you. The problem is Satan conveniently leaves out the last part of that verse. There's now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. 
there is condemnation for a non-believing world. Now, at this point, if you say to yourself, well, I don't think I want the condemnation part, well, then get in Jesus. Anybody can get in Christ by surrendering your life to Him and trusting what He did on the cross for your sins. And then there is, therefore, now no condemnation. But for a non-believer, this is Satan's lie. He wants to convince you. There's no condemnation, you're good as you are. And that's a lie. Let me tell you the second way that Satan loves to lie about condemnation. He likes to lie to believers and tell them that they are condemned. You're not good at all. You're just a miserable sinner. Why in the world would you even think that God could forgive you of that? That's how he whispers to us. I guarantee you. And it's almost palpable in the room. There are plenty of people here today in Christ, but under a heavy weight of condemnation that you should not be carrying because in Christ there is no condemnation. But Satan has been lying to you over and over again, and it gives birth to the twin children of condemnation, which is shame and guilt. And you've been carrying around shame and guilt under a heavy load of condemnation when it's not what God has designed for you and it's not what God has declared over you. What God declares over those who are in Christ is there is therefore now no condemnation. So Satan comes along and he whispers, you're condemned. How could you think that God would forgive you? And God comes along and says, I died for you. You are forgiven. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? See, a lot of times what you start to say to yourself is, well, I know that God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And that sounds very holy, but it's actually very haughty. Because what you're saying is, Jesus, I know that you lived the life I couldn't live. You died the death I deserve to die. You paid the price in full on the cross. But for me and my situation, that just wasn't enough. Who gave you the promotion above Jesus? Because Jesus settled it on the cross. So when you say, I know you've forgiven me, Jesus, you say yes, but I say no. Jesus says, no, my yes is yes. And when I say yes, it is. And there's a struggle in your heart over it. And there are some of you who are quicker to give grace to others, but not to yourself. You need to understand Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus. Now, usually the people who don't accept Satan's lie will lie to themselves to convince themselves that they are, that they are under condemnation, and it usually comes out of a heart that is sensitive, a heart that is tender, Because you are painfully aware of your sin, you are painfully aware of your faults and your failures. And so those things begin to weigh on you heavily. And even though Christ died for it, because you're so focused on your faults and failures, you continue to carry around the shame and guilt that God doesn't intend for you to carry around. My advice and counsel to you is, to stop focusing as much on your fault and failures and start looking more to Jesus' authority and victory. Because when you look at your faults and your failures, that's condemnation. When you look at Jesus' authority and victory, that's adoration. Stop Stop wallowing and start worshiping. Is somebody hearing me today on this? Stop wallowing and start worshiping. There's no condemnation for you. In Christ Jesus. When you become self-centered and focused, I know you don't intend that, but that's what happens. You focus on your faults, your failures, your sins, your past. You're not really focusing on Jesus and worshiping him and adoring him for what he's done for you. And thus you continue to lie to yourself. It's bad enough that Satan lies to us, but it's just as bad now when we lie to ourselves. So you put yourself under condemnation because you're lying to yourself and not accepting what Jesus has done. Stop wallowing, start worshiping. 
And then there's one more way that condemnation will creep into our lives, and it is what, what I refer to as the exhumers, the exhumers. Now, here's what I mean by this. Let me, let me explain. Um, and perhaps it's because I watch too much Dateline and forensic files. Um, but you know, they exhume bodies from the grave when they have to do some kind of usual, a criminal investigation, they have to do some further scientific study on a corpse, and so they exhume a body from the ground. They dig it up, and they have to investigate it further and look more closely, okay? Now, it's always a painful thing. You know, if you've ever watched something like Dateline or Forensic Files, and, and you see that them exhuming the casket out of the ground, and a family is standing around, it's usually a very painful thing. They, they, you know, they're weeping. This is, it's dreadful. It's, it's very uncomfortable because it's, it feels very unnatural. You know the old saying, is like when somebody dies, let them rest in peace. So when you're digging up the grave, it feels very unnatural and uncomfortable. It's sad, it's emotional, it's painful. And, and so what really needs to happen is things that are buried need to stay buried. What happened to your sin when you received Christ as your Savior? It was buried with Him. Romans 6 verse 4 says that we were buried with Christ in His death. Micah 7 19 says God casts all our sins into the depths of the sea. Jeremiah 31 34 says God will remember our sins no more. But there are some exhumers in your life who love to dig stuff up on you. And they won't let, let stuff that's dead stay dead. Even though you've been forgiven. Even though you have repented. There are some exhumers in your life. You know who they are. Don't look down the row right now. Look right here. Look right up here. <laughs> Don't look down the row. It's people who like to dig up the past. They drudge stuff up. Let me just tell you something. When people drudge stuff up on you, they are not acting in the spirit of Jesus. They're acting in the spirit of Satan. And here's what we typically do as a reaction. When people start being grave diggers on us, we tend to try to be a better grave digger. So we start lobbing the same things at them. Well, you, you want to remind me of that? Okay, well, let me just go back on you 25 years. And then it becomes like a poker game. Well, I'll raise you 30 years, and I'll go back on you 35. And then we're just dr we're drudging up and digging up all kinds of stuff that should stay buried because it was under the blood of Christ. When people do that to you, instead of lobbing rockets back and say, well, well let me remind you of your path, here's what you simply need to do. I'm sorry you still think that about me, but I know God doesn't think that about me because he forgave that about me. And he sees me as someone who is no longer under condemnation. And then walk out of the room. And listen, don't you be the grave digger either. Don't you dig up stuff on your spouse, that's the spirit of Satan. Don't you dig up stuff on your friends, that's the spirit of Satan. Don't you dig up stuff on your kids. That's the spirit of Satan. And God says to us, there's therefore for now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Walk in that newness of life. Now, can you feel it in the room? Because people struggle with this. I'm here today to, to tell you that some of you are going to leave here freer than you came in. In fact, I want us to say the verse out loud and together. Romans 8, 1. Say this verse out loud. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to personalize this. And now I want you to read it like this. Here we go. There is therefore now no condemnation to me because I am in Christ Jesus. Just let that sink in for a minute. There's therefore now no condemnation to me because I'm in Christ. I'm not saying that what you may have done is not a big deal. What I am saying is that what Christ did for you is a bigger deal. That's why we need to receive what he says to us.
There's no condemnation to you who are in Christ Jesus. The second exhortation, as I said, is pretty self-explanatory, but back to our two is there's no separation from the love of God. Verses 37 to 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, not only does God not condemn you when you were in Christ, but there is nothing you have done or could do that would stop God from loving you. If you're a parent, you get this. I mean, kids will sometimes disappoint parents. They will sometimes hurt parents. They will sometimes even betray their parents. But parents never stop loving their kids. The love of the Father towards us is the same. Of course we have and will disappoint our Father in heaven. We will betray Him. We will hurt Him. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that despite that, He's our Father and He loves us. He doesn't love what we do, but He loves us. There is nothing that can separate us from His love. Not angels, not demons, not life or death, not things in the past or things in the future. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. So, two simple takeaways for you to leave here with. In Christ, I am no longer under any condemnation no condemnation, and no separation from his love. God has forgiven me, and God loves me, and there is nothing and no one who can change that. That is God's promise to us in Christ. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today. Build us up, Lord. Strengthen our hearts to leave here today knowing no condemnation, no separation, no condemnation, no separation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.